All right, test. All right, everybody there can hear me? Yeah. All right, looks like we're waiting on one or two more. Uh, one more in person and a cable. We hook up to the monitor. So uh, as soon as that's done we'll be ready to rock and roll i've got three files in the file box here if you guys want to go ahead and download those uh, we'll be using them a little later getting feedback everybody that's not me go ahead and uh, mute their microphones yeah we got somebody with a hot mic Is that better? All right, so I guess if you have a question, go ahead and unmute your microphone uh, during the meeting, and otherwise just go ahead and leave it muted. Seems like that'll work better. All right, so we're getting set up here to uh, give us another five or six minutes, and then we should be able to get started.
Yeah, JB Rotary, I had it on mute. Can you hear me now? Hey, everybody in the uh, chat app, just let me know if you can hear me okay. Chucks, yeah, I can hear you clearly. Yeah, I can hear you clearly. Okay, because uh, JB was saying that he couldn't get any audio. <laughs> you should be able to get 100% done uh, tomorrow during the, uh, the hands-on portion, as well as gain pretty good insight into what you're looking for uh, longer term if you start seeing your tune fuel trims or whatever coming out of whack, what you should be looking for to fix. Okay. So if I were to send you the uh, money for day two today, that'd be fine still? Yeah, yeah, that'd be fine. We've only got, uh, let's see, about five people for tomorrow. So, yeah, we can definitely handle one more if you want to go ahead and get in for day two. All right, can everybody uh, hear me? I think we're missing a couple of people, but hopefully they'll jump in as we progress. Uh, the guys here were waiting on that cable still. Eric went to go get it. So um, they'll just have to kind of jump in once uh, Eric gets back. Let me make sure. Let's see here. Oh, let me, let me eat. Put on the, uh, hey, can one of you guys do me a favor while I'm setting up? Will you jump on the RX-80 Club and let Carbonate know how to friend me on uh, TeamViewer? Yes, no, maybe? Yeah, I'll send them a couple of posts or yeah, I'll PM. Yeah, I'll send them a or PM. Okay. Oh, shoot. I guess I gotta pull this up here. It might be him right there, Ryan. All right. Anybody else that were other than the 1.3 liters? Okay. 1.3 liters of furry. Of furry. <laughs> Does he need a message anymore? Need a message anymore? <laughs> hey, Ryan, you there? All right, so JB's good. It 
Someone's got a hot mic. They need to mute their microphone. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Ryan, can you hear me? Just in the chat window, you can just put that uh, you're good to go. All right. So, Ryan's in, and I think that was the only guy. Is your mic not working, Ryan? Or, but you can hear me. All right. Uh, under the voiceover IP, there's a little mute button that you should be able to press and unmute if you need to talk. But if you leave it on, it tends to cause feedback. Yeah, is that working? Yeah, is that working? Yeah, that's working. Um, All right, cool. Like I said, right. just keep it muted when you don't have a question because we're having some feedback issues. All right, so mute right. if I don't say anything. anything. Correct. Appreciate it. Got it. Okay. So, like I said, we'll once the the cable comes back, we'll take a, a admin pause um, so that we can uh, hook up the cable for the projector for the guys that are here. Uh, but let's go ahead and get this party started. All right. Like I said, if you have a question, just go ahead and. Uh, Unmute your microphone and jump in so that I can hear you. We're going to kind of work as best we can here with the equipment that we have until it, uh, that cable gets here. Yeah. All right, well, welcome to the tuning session here. My name is Kane. Um, everybody's probably at least heard of me. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here. Um, what we're going to be covering today is some of the basics of engine physics, how to organize a tune, set it up, uh, what do, what maps influence what using the Cobb or the Mazda Edit, for those of you that are using the Mazda Edit, and um, do probably get a little bit of hands-on stuff just so you guys are familiar with it, And but we won't be doing anything real vehicle-specific until tomorrow. Um, so like I said, welcome, everybody. And uh, again, if you have questions, unmute the mic. And go ahead and feel free to interrupt me so we can stop, try not to get too far behind. And uh, I always joke that tuning is the, the most, the coolest, most boring thing on earth, and you guys are about to realize why. The idea of tuning is really awesome, making big power, strapping the dyno, all this kind of stuff. The reality is, is you're just gonna be, you're crunching numbers and doing physics, and everything has to be done a certain way uh, to be effective. So it, the end result is it's not quite as uh, glamorous as we'd all like it to be. All right, so this is the stuff we're going to be covering today. Uh, we'll go over a quick intro via online as well as around the room, uh, talk about our training goals specifically, like what kind of vehicles you guys have, what you're looking to do. Uh, we'll get into some of the engine physics, volumetric efficiency, uh, persistence, otherwise known as explosions, uh, engine basics, modifications. We'll get into some forced induction stuff, talk about the actual math for calculating your injectors, how long they need to be open and closed, uh, how to size a compressor map, both turbocharged and supercharged, uh, whether to build or buy your own system. Then we'll get into the actual specifics of tuning uh, electric fuel injection, go over the math, planning a tuning session, going through step by step, finishing the, the tuning, doing a dyno session, and then we'll get into the practical exercises, which are the uh, more of the hands-on tuning stuff. So that's what we'll be covering. Uh, we're going to take a break. We'll take a break when that cable gets here, and then after that, we'll try and take a break about every hour for five or ten minutes, just so everybody can uh, stretch their legs and stuff. All right, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a former IT nerd that joined the Army uh, to become a master. And I'm a mass diver now, but I be to become a diver. Uh, so I was a software junkie back in the day, project manager for a company called the Beanstalk Group, doing web-based application development. Had a midlife crisis, joined the Army, came diver. Long story short, started getting into forced induction and tuning. So I saw that we have air pressure-related situations, we have explosions, and then we have software that manages it all. So I was like, oh, well, this makes a little sense. So I sort of self-taught or self-educated myself in, in that process and how everything works together, and then the rest is sort of history. Um, so 
that all being said, I have a pretty good practical working knowledge and a relatively good theoretical working knowledge, but I don't have like a PhD in physics. So I know what general gas law is and how it works. I can't necessarily sit here and calculate exactly what the equations are for, you know, how many parts per million of carbon monoxide is going to be in your exhaust pipe based on your flow through rates and all that kind of stuff. Um, right. you haven't seen this uh, video is pretty funny. Um, this was me in the desert when uh, first got started messing around with turbos and stuff when I was deployed in Iraq and we put a turbocharger in a land cruiser. I don't know how well you can see it. Uh, but see the turbo sticking through the top of the uh, hood there. <laughs> so we, we get it welded it with the stuff we had in place and uh, use some silicone to cover the hat where the uh, intake bolts up to the car so that we would have an air pressure leak through and then beat the piss out of something like that's funny. So we have our very phallic shaped air filter. Good stuff. <laughs> A lot of passes. <laughs> so we took that off. We don't need air filter. Highly overrated. <laughs> it cost us 220 bucks for the entire vehicle and turbo and everything. <laughs> we had it was an old Volvo Penta Turbo laying around. It was for a uh, marine engine for one of our fat boats. And somebody had boxed it up years ago and it was just sitting in a box. So we started unpacking when we got deployed to Iraq. We don't have that boat anymore, but you don't have to mind if I use this, do you? So we got our garden hose action, some PVC pipe, <coughs> our oil sending unit. Oh, man. You'll see the, we have six different fittings to get from the block to the uh, oil line for the turbo. Pretty high speed. You got our water hose for the coolant there. Garden hose, look at that. All the little fittings right there. <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of goes to show you that the less you care about the vehicle, obviously the more fun you can have with it and the more power that you can make. Um, so anyway, just kind of a funny thing. I said it cost us 220 bucks, and the only thing we had to buy was the waste gate because you didn't want to give us a waste gate. Everything else we either found or built ourselves. Had a blast with it. Um, if I could have brought it back home, I would have. I still be driving that same thing if I could have. But uh. Yeah, just a little bit of fun stuff, but it goes to show you that it's not quite as complicated as you would think. Um, there we go. So here's some uh, kind of some of the vehicles I've owned or played with over the years. I've done some off-road stuff and some on-road stuff. Um, the point of what between the you know funny video and everything, the point I'm trying to make is that like nobody's really an expert. You hear a lot of people say, "Oh, I'm." Whatever, you know, I'm God's gift to tuning, or I'm God's gift to suspension, or I'm God's gift to braking. The reality is it's all just dependent upon your experience. So, like, for me personally, I have very little suspension geometry and drivetrain experience. So, when it comes to, like, the off-road and stuff, and they start talking about swapping gears and lockers versus limited slip versus all this crap, I go to somebody with more experience than me. Because I'm not going to take the time to learn about it. Um, same with... Racing suspension, set up, camber caster, all that kind of stuff. I sort of have an idea of how it works, but not nearly the experience that some of the pro autocrossers, TRX8 type guys have. So I don't even bother. I just go ask them the questions. Um, that being said, as we get into our working group here, we've got about 10 people in this class, both online and in person. All of you have an experience with some sort of motor performance that I don't have. So as we learn, you know, make sure we learn from each other. Make sure you guys get involved in the forums. Um, the last class I taught in San Antonio for the Sarks guys, they do a lot of helping each other out based on they have that basic working knowledge. And so they would bounce stuff off each other. You, know, you guys you should be doing the same thing. You're all relatively local for the people that are not online. Um, so it's just you just one no one person can have all the experience required to to master this whole thing. 
All right, so for the guys that are local, the restroom is right on the other side of this wall right here. Uh, there's a refrigerator in the back of, this, of the shop itself with some sodas and water and stuff like that if you guys get thirsty. Uh, we don't have any coffee, <clears throat> which I'm hoping we can rectify here before uh, too long. I do like coffee. Um, like I said, we want to learn from each other. No bad ideas. If you have a question, ask it. Go ahead and interrupt. Stop the class so that uh, we don't get anybody that's lost. Um, all right, so we, we know we're all RX-8 guys, um, but otherwise, you know, let's talk about why it is that we're here, what we're looking to do. I'm going to start with the guys that are in person, and then we'll cycle through the guys that are in line. So, obviously, you have an RX-8. Is it naturally aspirated or... Yeah, it's naturally aspirated, but thanks to the guy sitting beside me, I want to turbo it now because he bought a turbo and we've been childhood friends and he can't be faster. That has a valid point. <laughs> a very valid reason to spend 10 grand, absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So you're hoping that you can kind of get an idea for the tuning and the baseline portion of it. Yeah. Um, and then I did the last one too. I was, I was one of the online guys for the last one. Okay. And forgot everything since it. So <laughs> yeah, it's, I didn't take very good notes. <laughs> Yeah, especially if you don't use it, too. If you don't do the hands-on stuff, it's very easy to forget everything. Okay. Yeah, I'm still naturally aspirated, aspirated but just by myself. But you actually have the turbo. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't done anything with it yet because I just got here a couple weeks ago or a week ago. But, okay. Um, so I'm hoping to you know, learn about what that's going to look like as far as what I'm going to need to do. That system, as well as naturally aspirated, because I'm going to be running that Yeah, and you guys both have the advantage of if you get it done, dial in right, naturally aspirated, it makes the transition to force induction a lot easier. Yeah. Naturally aspirated, and I have aspirations to find a private supercharger. So. Okay. So maybe a supercharger action later on. Sounds good. All right, let's start with some of the online guys here. Uh, I'll just start from the top. Ryan, you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. For the most part, I've worked with uh, Kane last part, summer doing uh, my naturally aspirated last summer. Doing my naturally aspirated. Just to get a more in-depth background, a little bit more information on what exactly is going on. Currently working on both my RX-8, and I got a new SDR that I'm ready to start back. So, it's just good to know basics. So, just good to know basics. Okay, so you said you have a, you have an SCI as well. What was that? What was that? You said you have an STI as well. As yeah, I just picked up a 2015 STI yeah, last I just week. Yeah, I picked up a 2015 STI last week. Nice. Okay, cool. Well, I'll, uh, remind me as we get through, and I'll kind of cover some of the uh, factory boost controller tuning options with uh, using the Cobb. That way, you can get started on that one too. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. All right, uh, Jay Cundy, you want to chime in? Yeah, hi, and uh, Jimmy Flick here from New Zealand. Yeah, hi, and uh, Jimmy Flick here um, from New Zealand. I've got a gritty kit um, sitting on the floor I've of my garage at the moment, waiting to be installed in my car, and, and I just bought Mazda here, yeah. and I uh, couldn't stop playing yeah. with it, so I wanted to and, uh, learn a bit more about how to use it effectively on the in-app set up before I go for some action. Set up before I go for some action. Sounds good. Like I was just telling the other guys here, uh, you know, once you dial it in naturally aspirated, it makes the transition to forced induction a lot easier. Yeah, um, Bredis is because you know going to change the cab. Um, I've bought him a few beers already, um, so I'm <laughs> kind of laying the groundwork for that, but I um, still like to understand uh, quite a lot about what he's doing so I can maintain the maps after he's got the initial map laid out if I can't do it myself after this course. All right, sounds good. Uh, Antavius? Hi, uh, my name is Antavius. Um, my car is currently Hi, uh, in the shop getting the motor rebuilt. Uh, but once I get it back, I plan to install a, uh, uh, a modified gritty uh, turbo set up. And I just like some information on Sue as to what's going on with the tune in with the car back to sport. Right on. Are you gonna actually tune it yourself, or are you having a shop do it? And you just want to be educated. Uh, or? Plan to have someone else tune it. Uh, probably you. Plan to have someone else tune it. But just, uh, I just wanted to get a general idea as to what's going on. I just wanted to get a general idea as to what's going on. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, JB. JB, you there? 
Yeah, we already bored him to death. Okay, Shax. Okay, yeah, okay. Guys, okay, um, yeah, my name is Misha. I'm Guys, from the Caribbean. Uh, um, I have an UK spec RT. RT. Um, my intention is to naturally uh, 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 tune in any uh, engine. Uh, in any um, engine. Probably later down the road, I'm gonna do the uh, custom YouTube. Probably later down the road, I'm gonna do the. I'm going to tune, I'll pick out the tune in myself, because uh, where I'm at is a uh, lack of uh, tuners, so maybe I'll be doing some other RX-8 at the same time, so that's basically it. Alright, sounds good. Sounds like a lot of you guys uh, decided to do some tuning in naturally aspirated and then going into force induction, so that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what about you, Isaac? Did you say me? Yes. Isaac? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what kind of uh, setup you got going on with your vehicle? Uh, right now it's just uh, naturally aspirated RX-8. Um, I wanted to join the class just so I could learn the tuning. I think there's tons of potential uh, to learn that. It's applicable to pretty much every single car. So it opens up that whole world for my next vehicle, which I'm not sure what that's going to be, but I know it's going to be some type of force induction. All right, sounds good. Yeah, like I was just telling Ryan, um, if you master or if you get a good handle on tuning the RX-8, you can tune any car in the world. Um, you'll see as we go through the multiple injectors and multiple spark plug issue is such a pain in the butt to work around. And then when you see how easy the piston guys have it when it comes to like getting their mass airflow sensor right and all this kind of stuff, you're going to be kind of jealous. But uh, if you do end up getting another vehicle that's piston related or with a factory boost controller, uh, you have a lot more options, which is kind of nice. All right. Let's go. I don't know what happened to my PowerPoint. There we go. All right, so there we go. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the goals of training. Uh, we're going to go over these same questions at the very end of the, the presentation. So just something to kind of be thinking about. Um, key concepts and ideas, you know, the high-level stuff is where our goal is to bring you to, you know, that level four, what they call a knowledge base, where you don't remember all the details necessarily, but you remember how everything works. Um, using an old IT nerd adage, uh, database administration, database design hasn't changed in 30 years. So if you know how to do a parent-child relationship and create that, that database structure, the most latest and greatest version of you know Microsoft SQL Server or whatever works exactly the same as the old stuff from back in the early 90s. Um, so we want to do sort of the same thing with tuning. We want to have those high-level concepts, know how stuff interrelates and talks to each other, then you can spend the time with your specific platform or specific piece of software determining how that software relates to that engine. But the physics, how tuning works, it happens is the same for every vehicle and every EMS. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking to do. And like I said, at the end, we'll kind of re readdress these three questions. But these are some of the things I want you guys to keep in mind as we progress. Okay. Uh, we'll kind of start covering some of these gas laws, and hopefully uh, Easy e comes back with my cable here before it gets too much later so we can uh, get the projector working. <laughs> Since everybody comes from a different background, um, we kind of start at the ground level and work our way up. So bear with me if you have uh, already have a good working knowledge of engine physics, but some people may not. So let's just go ahead and start from the top. Get everybody on the same page before we start covering the specific tuning of our vehicle. All right, so gas laws. The general gas law is volume, pressure, and temperature are all interrelated. If you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure, you increase the temperature, vice versa. If you have a fixed volume and you increase the temperature, it'll increase the pressure. If you have a fixed volume, increase the pressure, it'll increase the temperature. So on and so on. So those three things are all inversely related. Volume, pressure, and temperature. 
those are the three components that we use in an engine. So when one of those components change, the other two will always change. You can't have any pressure change with as the, during your compression stroke without having some sort of temperature change. And obviously the volume change comes from the rotor or the piston moving. So all that latent heating and cooling all has to be taken into account when we're talking about engine tuning and making power. All right, so we're talking about the pressure gradient. What we're talking about is the difference between whatever pressure is in your air intake, or you can either think of it as ambient if you're naturally aspirated, um, but if you're forced induction, you're going to have actual positive pressure in the intake. So whatever the pressure is outside of your system, which is the engine, and the pressure that's inside your chamber, whatever that difference is, it affects the speed that the air actually flows into the engine. Okay, so when we are talking about uh, race engines, exhaust or intake scavenging, radical cams, radical porting, and all that kind of stuff. What they're the whole goal of all of that is to make the pressure differential between the ambient intake track and our engine combustion chamber as great as possible. So if you get a hundred percent vacuum out of your compression chamber and you have 15 psi loaded up in your intake track, that's how you're going to get the highest amount of molecules of air into the intake track, okay? So the pressure gradient re re refers to the speed that that happens as opposed to the amount of pressure. So I want to get everybody kind of away from that concept of, well, how many PSI of boost are you running? Well, who gives a flying rat's ass? It doesn't matter how many PSI of boost you're running. What you care about is that pressure gradient, the speed that the molecules move, the total engine flow through. Those are all the important things to keep in mind. So the higher your pressure is, the high end pressure, and, and or the lower that your low pressure is, affects that speed, allows for more molecules to transfer. So that's why we do things like uh, radical porting on piston engines. Even if you're not forced induction, the idea is at a certain RPM, the vacuum pulse width from the exhaust leaving the engine system creates more of a vacuum in the intake track, which allows for a lower low pressure gradient, allowing more ambient air into the engine cycle. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good. Let's go ahead and move right along. Okay. So talking about uh, partial pressure of O2. So we've kind of covered the gas flaws, we've covered our pressure gradient, okay? But we're all, at that point, talking about air. What makes power in our system is the oxygen. The partial pressure of oxygen that's loaded in your compression chamber directly relates to how much fuel you can burn and how much power that you can make. We have different ways of increasing the partial pressure of O2. One way is to pressurize the intake. If we pressurize the intake, we have more molecules in a fixed space, so they're closer together. More O2 molecules, we raise the partial pressure of O2, and we are therefore able to make more power. Um, if we use nitrous, we're doing sort of the same thing, except without the pressure increase, right? We're just injecting uh, was liquid oxygen that becomes vapor. We're increasing the number of O2 molecules that are in the intake tract, so it has the net effect exactly the same as a turbocharger or a supercharger, okay? So what makes the power is the partial pressure of O2. So when you start talking about tuning and we start looking at reading airflow maps, looking at your boost pressure, all that kind of happy fun stuff, what we're specifically talking about is how much O2 can you shove into your engine. Uh, one of the guys in my last class brought up the idea of running 100% O2 to the engine, would that be a viable option? Well, it would be highly flammable, and you'd probably blow your engine up. However, he's barking up the right tree. If we got one of those medical O2, you guys seen those, like an ambulances or whatever? Um, you're, no. Okay. okay. We had one of those and ran that line straight to the engine's intake, you would be able to make a very large amount of power without any increase in pressure, because your partial pressure of O2 would be through the roof. The problem with it 
is as O2 gets compressed, it tends to any kind of little burr or metal shaving that's in that track will tend to cause it to ignite and you know create huge catastrophic fires. So that's why they don't use it for cars, um, and we don't go above 33 percent usually O2 like in a diver's breathing mix for the same reason because it's pressurized and you don't want it to catch the line on fire as it hits one of those little threads in your uh, in your scuba rig. <coughs> um, funny story about the O2 thing. We had a go-kart, my second tour in uh, the desert, that one of my former bosses had taken one of those medical bottles of O2 for, we had a race, we were going with, against some other unit on base, we were having like a grand championship. So we had a bottle of O2 and he ran it via that plastic feed line to the carburetor and just stuck it right there where the air intake is for the carb. And that thing ran like a rape date. I mean, it was hauling. <laughs> so we was driving around like a crazy man in this go-kart, and then he stops, and he get, you hear that intake backfire, and everybody just like stops, like, oh, crap, what have we done? And you can see the little ball of fire going backtracking through the O2 line because it's clear plastic. <laughs> heading toward the uh, the bottle of oxygen, so we all run out there, dash and yank the little plastic tube off, and you know keep it from catching on fire. But the car was all burned up; it was trash. You know? <laughs> but at least it didn't have an explosion. So that's the short story of why we don't use O2. I'm going to test it here in one second. Why we don't use O2, 100% O2. But we do want to increase the partial pressure of O2 to the highest level possible via pressurization. Increases in volumetric efficiency or nitrous oxide, some other type of mixed gas. Uh, do we have any questions about partial pressure of O2 before we take a break? You're not actually measuring oxygen directly. It's just saying this is how much. Yeah. Ideally, if you could measure the oxygen directly, that would be the best way to go. Yeah. But we don't, as of yet, short of a mass airflow sensor which is the closest you're going to get to that, we don't have a really good way of doing a direct measurement um, of O2. So but you're just you're you want to calculate it because, like I said, that's what makes your power. So, for example, if I can, this turbo will pressurize something to 10 PSI and keep the temperature relatively cool, but if I jump it to 12 PSI and it warms up, it creates a less dense air, which one of those is actually going to make more power? Well, which are the ones putting the more O2 into your system? So you don't always want to keep cracking up the boost. At a certain point, you're like, oh, no, I'm good. This is all the boost this engine can take. Just leave it alone. Okay. <coughs> all right, any questions for anybody online? No? Okay. Well... That actually was pretty easy to hook up the projector, so I'm going to go ahead and move on, and we're going to take a break in about five minutes. Okay. So, then we talked about O2. All right, so mixed gas. The reason why we're talking about mixed gas is because of that nitrous oxide thing that we were talking about. If you change the percentage of oxygen in your air stream, you technically are no longer using air. It's technically a mixed gas. Doesn't really affect you in a day-to-day -day basis, other than you know trivial pursuit type stuff. It's important for divers to know, but it's also important for you guys to realize. <coughs> excuse me, because it's classified as a hazardous material when it comes to traveling and things like that. So. Some states have outlawed nitrous for on-road use altogether. Some states haven't. Uh, it just depends on your local laws there. But, but it is considered a mixed gas. It is considered hazardous material. Okay? So just bear with it and keep that in mind. All right. So why do we care? Okay, well, we care because we have different options of increasing that partial pressure of O2. Uh, one option is obviously the turbo, which is an air compressor. A supercharger is an air compressor. Compresses the air, more molecules in the same space, increases the partial pressure of O2. But you also can do bore and stroke if you have a piston motor, okay? And by increasing the bore, you increase the volumetric efficiency. Uh, by increasing the stroke, 
you're actually increasing that low that we talked about in the pressure gradient inside and therefore allowing for a lower low, the same high you had before, but we still get that higher pressure gradient, more O2 into the system. And then intake efficiency is what the factory RX-8 guys kind of went with, um, where you get into your variable porting, variable valve timing for the piston guys, things like that that are just trying. But those are all designed to do is align intake pulse width with the exhaust pulse width. Air does not move in a solid stream. It's, it doesn't move in a singular thing, okay? You get little pulses of air, little slugs, if you will, that move along on the intake track. So if your slug of exhaust, as it leaves the engine, is perfectly aligned with your slug of intake air that goes into the engine, behind that slug of exhaust is a vacuum. So it, it lowers the low low in your pressure gradient will allow for more air into the engine. Okay, that's why all this stuff is important. What you decide to do engine mod wise needs to be based on some of these principles of whether you're going to lower your low or raise the high of your pressure gradient or increase the molecules of oxygen in your system. Those are really the only three options that you have to make more power. Figure out which one you want to do. We'll talk about the pros and cons of them a little bit and then move on from there. But as far as tuning, the electronic part of it, all we're really trying to do is marry whatever you physically are doing to increase your partial pressure of O2 to the corresponding changes in your fueling and your ignition to match that. You can't make power with tuning by itself. You can fix a crappy tune, but you can't make more new power that was never there. Uh, you hear a lot of stories about the old Mustang 5.0 guys. You get like a power, power chip or a ROM programmer and gain 80 horsepower. Oh, this thing is the greatest thing since sliced bread. No, what it means is, is that the factory Ford tune was so god awful that there was that much free power sitting on the table because those guys were too lazy to do it right from, from the factory. All right, one more slide and we'll take a break. Okay, so volumetric efficiency, you guys heard me talk about that. Um, specifically, what we're looking at is what percent of your engine's volume is currently filled with 21% or 0.21 ATAs of oxygen. All right, that's what it means. So 100% volumetric efficiency means that your 80 cubic inch engine has 80 cubic inches worth of oxygen in it. Right? You can think of it as air or oxygen. Oxygen is a more accurate uh, description. <coughs> Excuse me. So, if you had a Tupperware container or this Mountain Dew can, you opened it, right? You had a vacuum in it before as it fills up. Okay, this is now at 100% volumetric efficiency. Completely full of air. But, if I had some sort of exhaust mechanism that was just pulling air from it, depending on how long I kept the top open, it may not be 100% full of air, right? So that's a less than one volumetric efficiency. If I pressurize it via a compressor, it may be full of more than 14.7 PSI, which would bring it above 100% volumetric efficiency. Right? In the real world, of an engine operating, it is almost impossible to hit 100% volumetric efficiency. In the RX-8, in its factory form, there's a narrow band right around 5,500 RPMs or so, where it'll go just above 100%. But for the most part, it's 80 to 90 throughout the RPM band. When you start doing your turbocharging and supercharging and stuff like that, You'll get above 100% volumetric efficiency, but it'll never correspond directly to how much boost you're pushing because of all the other losses. You're always having some loss of efficiency. That loss of efficiency shows up as extra heat in your engine, right? And extra unburnt fuel in your exhaust pipe, things like that. So you have to account for it with some of our tuning. But the goal is to raise the efficiency of the engine as high as we can get. So when we start talking about VE, that's what we're talking about, volumetric efficiency, making the engine as efficient as we possibly can.
All right, so um, we talk about RAM error, because uh, people always seem, seem to bring it up in these classes. All right, RAM error, what they're referring to is at a very, very high speed. We're talking 85 miles per hour or greater. There is such a thing as a RAM error effect where the molecules will actually squeeze together a little bit closer before being forced into your intake, okay, that will increase the volumetric efficiency of your engine by just a hair and only at very, very high uh, speeds. And then the cold air induction increases your volumetric efficiency by bringing in colder, more dense air into your intake tract. But if you already have a cold air induction, it doesn't do you any good to have a cooler, louder, more interesting cold air induction. It's still doing the exact same thing. Okay, so the factory RX-8 intake takes air from the ambient pressure, nice and cool and dense, you're good to go. You want to grab one of those uh, the Mazda Speed version, right? Same thing, just louder, cool. However, if you take the, uh, what's it called? Which one sticks it in the engine bay? The k and Cyclone, yeah, yeah. So if you take that, which is now louder, with a more free-flowing filter, but it's inside the engine bay sucking down hot engine air, you're actually losing power because you're sucking in less dense air. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they open up the filter to try and create more airflow, and all it does is allow for more crap in it. So it's like less of a filter and more of a screen. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, okay, so the old saying that there's no replacement for displacement should it actually be there's no replacement for volumetric efficiency. Bigger engine, whatever, whatever, that doesn't matter. Efficiency of the engine is what matters. So a 2.0 liter four banger that's running at 200% volumetric efficiency is exactly as powerful as a four liter V8 or V6 or whatever, right? Theoretically, everything else being uh, without, undecided, it's exactly the same level of power. Uh, this is a twin turbo Dodge Viper. This guy, uh, kind of a funny story, he's out in Vegas. He kept getting dusted off by Habusas and uh, street bikes driving around the Dodge Viper. And he was all upset because he had a Dodge Viper and he wanted to be the fastest car on the road. Yeah, for real. <laughs> so he takes it to the speed shop and has two, uh, I think I want to say it's like a 120 or 140 AR turbos put in, ball bearing, oil water cooled. So you've got a V10 twin turbo. It has something like 1400 horsepower. Way more money than it says. But he got his, he got his car. He had a booster killer. That thing would, would take a booster from the line. It was pretty wild. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how they dress the tracks for well, I mean, you're, you're driving in traffic. I'm driving anywhere without a traffic. Well, obviously, if you got that kind of dough, you're not probably worried about driving on traffic too much. I think, what, the factory Viper tires are 305 or something like that? Yeah, so, right. yeah they probably had to be 445 or something crazy. It's a tough one <laughs> Yeah. All right, well, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. Do we have any questions from the website guys so far? Yeah, Kane. Okay. I'm going to take that as a yeah, note. Yeah, I'm finding oh, yeah. it really hard to hear what you're saying. Yeah, I'm finding it really hard. I'm not to sure hear if it's a mind or if the other guys are experiencing sure the same thing as me. The other guys are experiencing the same thing as me. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to comment? Are they having a hard time hearing me? Yeah, it's getting a little uh, choppy. Yeah, it's getting a little uh, choppy. Okay. I'll. Uh, yeah. I think some of it's probably coming from a little bit of the background noise here, so we'll we'll get it readdressed after the break. Um, if you guys are start having a hard time hearing me, just make sure you go ahead and interrupt, and uh, I'll get closer to the microphone or whatever. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, and have, also, you a, sounds good. have you got a? Sounds good. Have you got a set of uh, headphones with a mic on it? Have you got a set of uh, headphones? I'm with just a wondering mic if that might help the situation a bit. I'm just wondering if that might help the situation a bit. Um, I, 
I can look around for a set of headphones and see about it. Um, I think the issue right now is the projector might be creating a little bit of background noise. Uh, I'm not sure. Is that better? You guys hear me better now? Do but more speaking. Do but more speaking. Is it better without that background noise? I don't think it's that much better. I think it's that much better. A little better? Okay, I'm going to try to, uh, during the break, I'll try and move my laptop away from the projector and keep some of that background noise down. Yeah, that's a little better. Still pretty choppy, though. Yeah, that's a little better. Still pretty choppy, though. Okay, uh, let's take 10. I'm going to look and see if I can find a set of headphones with a mic on it, and uh, I'll also try to move this projector farther away, okay? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. And uh, Kane, and, uh, whenever Kane, there's a question, it might be beneficial for the web guys if you could repeat that question. If you could repeat that question. Okay. That I can do. Um, well, Ryan here just chop, chimed in with the VE question. So go ahead, Ryan. Ryan? Uh, okay. I guess Ryan doesn't want to talk to us right now. So, again, let's take a break, and we'll get to Ryan's question when we get back, and I'll try to find a better microphone.
Test, is this working? Isaac, you can hear me? I can hear All you. Right. Sorry. All right, thanks. I guess I got my mic back on. I don't know. It looks like it might be just in and out for a while. If you guys on the team viewer uh, have got a set of headphones, it makes it a lot easier to listen and talk at the same time as well, rather than using loudspeakers. No, unfortunately, I don't. I don't use Team Viewer that often. I'm just using the uh, headphones that I use on my phone. Usually, it's got a little mic on it. Hey, can you guys hear me better now? So far, it seems a bit better. <laughs> Say again? Seems a bit better so far. So it's a bit better, yeah. Okay, I got a headset on, so hopefully that'll make my make it sound better. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll roll this way, and hopefully it'll be better. I'm... If you guys have questions or whatever, I'll just have to repeat it back so everybody in the classroom um, actually hears it. So we'll go ahead and answer Ryan's, and then we'll continue on with the party. Isaac says just to tell you guys to shut up. So. They, said, they said noted. We'll see how well it works. Um, all right, so Ryan's question was, when we were talking about volumetric efficiency, how we used the VE map during last time I tuned his car last summer to tune out a lean spot in and why that's it's not a common practice but why we do use it um, and I, I was going to cover it a little bit more later in the class but the short version is you have multiple maps that interrelate in the cob one of which is the VE map which we talked about volumetric efficiency a minute ago and so when you have, say, a lean spot that's in every single gear, but it's in a very narrow window within a certain load and certain RPM, the best way to address that lean spot is in the VE map because what it's showing is that the volumetric efficiency of that particular engine it differs from stock, from the factory VE map that Mazda uses. And that can be based on an intake, a ported throttle body, a ported engine, uh, definitely a turbocharger or supercharger is going to affect that. It just it changes the VE curve. So that's when you address the VE map. The reason why we don't use the VE map first is because you typically want to address either your air intake sensors or your injector size, something that's mechanically off, rather than jumping straight to the VE map and saying, well, if I just change it here, it'll fix my problem. You don't want to fix the wrong problem. So you always start with your bigger variables. And when we talk about the tuning session, it should make more sense. But we want to start with whatever the largest variable is first that's going to change your whole map and then drill down into more and more detail as you go. And then you finally end up at that VE table where you're just changing a very narrow RPM and load band versus making these big, like you never want to go to the VE map and make these big, huge changes that cover a lot of area. If you're doing that in your VE map, you're barking up the wrong tree because you should be changing one of your sensors instead. 
Does that better answer your question, Ryan? Yes. You're, if you are trying to change your air fuel ratio target maps, especially if you're trying to change them all because you have problems in multiple gears, if your sensors are correct and everything else is good to go, then that's where you'd want to change it is in the AFR table or the uh, VE table. If you have, after you fix the VE table, if you have literally within a certain gear something that is a deviation from your target AFR, that's when you would change the AFR table. And I've tuned probably the better part of 60 plus cars, RX-8s, over the last four or five years. And I can safely say that I've never had to go to the target AFR table and change my target AFR. I've always been able to fix it with one of the other sensors or with the VE map. So if you want 12 to 1 AFR at wide open throttle, and that's what your target is in your AFR table, you should be able to fix all your sensors and your VE map and get everything dialed in so that you get very close to 12.1. If you go into the table and you put in 10 in your target AFR table in order to get 12, you're barking up the wrong tree. You're changing the wrong thing. Yes, even with FI. I've, that was the next question, was whether I had to do that at FI. Even with FI, I've never had to change the target AFR table. I've always changed all the other interrelated tables so that I get the target AFR that I want. Good. Any other questions? Okay. So let's go ahead and keep on cruising. <coughs> all right. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, engine cycle. I know you guys all probably have a very good understanding of this, but we'll just cover it real quick. Uh, one power stroke, which for a uh, four-stroke piston type of motor is actually two engine revolutions, um, but for rotaries it's one, right? So when the piston or rotor moves from top dead center to bottom dead center and back to top dead center is one engine cycle. For each engine rotation, you, you move from top dead center to bottom dead center, that's your intake stroke, it creates a vacuum, because the volume increases, right, without a corresponding uh, change. So it lowers temperature and creates a vacuum. Once that vacuum is created and you basically unseal that space by putting in or opening up your intake valve or the rotor passes the intake port, that vacuum causes the atmospheric air to push air into your engine chamber. So it's, it's not a, a sucking thing. Like a lot of people equate vacuum to sucking, it's the other way around. Vacuum causes the outside ambient pressure to push to fill that vacuum. The perfect volume of air of a naturally aspirated motor, right, would be the engine's displacement. So your rotary engine, which is 1.3 liters or 80 cubic inches, 80 cubic inches would be 100% volumetric efficiency, and it would completely fill that space with one atmosphere. Based on the speeds that the engine is moving, you very seldom will get the opportunity to fill it 100%, right? Because you only have a certain period of time that that air can move into the engine. Okay, so then as once it's ingested, you move to the next stage, the compression stroke, where the volume is now decreasing, right? You close your intake port, and you're now decreasing that volume, okay, which is compressing the air, creating heat but also giving it, and mixing it with fuel, giving it the opportunity to get that good air-fuel mixture inside your combustion chamber. You get somewhere in the neighborhood of top dead center. The spark plug ignites that, right? That ignition creates a uh, fuel-air explosion, basically, which expands, and as it expands, it forces that rotor to move or the piston to drive down, and that's actually the power stroke part of the engine cycle, where it's... And that power stroke acting on your eccentric shaft, right, is turning the other rotor, causing it to go through its intake and compression stroke and vice versa. Once you reach somewhere right around the bottom dead center is when 
your intake port then opens, and all that hot exhaust gas leaves the engine, and the whole cycle is repeated again, right? So that's an engine cycle. All right, so let's talk a little bit about explosions, my favorite subject. The flame speed, okay, so a fuel-air mixture is an explosive. We use the term brassants in the demolition world to reference the, the power of an explosion, the speed that, that it operates in, okay? So everything is baselined off of TNT. So a T, TNT has a relative effectiveness factor of one. It's the lambda of the demolition world. So higher explosives like RDX, C4, uh, Petten, things like that, have an RE greater than one. Like a nuclear explosion has an RE of like one million and five hundred thousand and something or other. I mean, it was a big explosion, right? Um, ammonium nitrate and other uh, fertilizer-based explosives, things like that, have an RE uh, less than one. Dynamite has an RE less than one because it's, it, its flame speed is slower than TNT, okay? So a fuel air explosion has an RE uh, factor of like 0.34 meters per second in its stoichiometric mixture. So 14.7 to 1 has a flame speed of 0.34 meters per second or a relative, RE factor of 0 0.0001. So it's like on the opposite scale of the nuclear explosion of the two chains. What you want to consider is the our low explosives, which like in the military or the civilian demolition world, we use for like moving earth. So we use ammonium nitrate for uh, trenching charges and stuff like that because it actually pushes the earth out of the way. We use high explosives like C4 to cut steel and uh, like all the IEDs that are been going off in the desert. Those use high explosives because that creates a cutting jet that will go through an MRAP or whatever. Right? So cutting charges, we want to use high explosives because they have more of a shattering effect and less of a pushing effect. We don't want to push the metal out of the way. We want it to stay where it's at and cut through it. When it relates to engine timing and fueling, right? as you create faster and faster flame speeds, you go from the pushing to the shattering or cutting. Um, if any of you guys have ever seen um, pre-ignition on a piston engine, right, where it causes, you'll see the top of the piston head, and it has a, a hole in it. That's the exact same hole that a elect explosively formed projectile, IED type around, puts in the side of a tank. It's, it's that cutting jet. It's literally the same thing. So as you get that flame speed higher and higher and higher, you are going to end up creating a cutting jet inside of your engine and it'll either in the case of a piston it'll pull right through the top in the case of a rotary it tends to shatter the seals because you, that the amount of that cast you know that cast rotor has a lot of uh, bulk to it so the weak link is the seals but it has the same net effect so when we're talking about timing we're talking about leaning out the fuel air mixture things like that as we lean the air fuel mixture we create a faster flame sp speed. As we advance timing, we create a faster flame speed because as you advance the timing, the engine is still in the compression stroke when that spark goes off. So now you have the compression of the air-fuel mixture happening at the same time that you have an expanding uh, flame already inside of the engine. Right? So these things move from the pushing side to the shattering side. So our goal for timing and for air-fuel mixtures is to get as close to the fastest flame speed that the engine can take. And unfortunately, you know, you sometimes find that by going too fast and causing engine damage. So there's always got to be that little bit of safety in the back of your mind. But for you guys that are looking at going forced induction later on, these are one of the things that you need to keep in mind. As you increase the volume and the density of the air and you increase the partial pressure of O2, by definition, that alone will increase your brassance in your engine. And it puts you much closer to that edge where you move from a push to a shatter.
that's when stuff starts to break. All right, so we talk about tuning. We're talking about the specifying the proper amount of fuel and the proper ignition time based on the specific spot that your engine is in, right? Modern day EFI engines can read from all of the sensors. It takes this, this moving engine, right? And it's moving at 64,000 hertz or whatever it is, um, the latest and greatest one. It, so it takes that moving engine and it can literally snapshot it. It takes that exact degree of angle of, of uh, eccentric shaft rotation, reads your air temperature, it reads your uh, air flow via the mass airflow sensor, the engine temperature, knock sensor, short-term fuel trim, long-term fuel trim, throttle position, everything, as a frozen in time moment. Takes all that information, does a bunch of math on it, and says, okay, for this engine situation, you need this much fuel, and you need to ignite your spark plug at this particular time. And then it does it, and it does that tens of thousands of times a second. It's a very, very fast process, all right? So the issue is is that the, the sensors that are built into the engine have a degree of error already built into them. Anything mass produced by a factory, engine sensors specifically um, have like a 10 to 15 percent error rate in them. So your injectors can be 10 percent bigger than his injectors, or 10 percent small. Or you could have ones that are 10 percent smaller, and he can have ones that are 10 percent bigger, and you're actually 20 percent different from each other. So when you're tuning the engine, what you're really doing is you're trying to make this process as accurate as humanly possible based on your specific engine. So that's why all the Cobb Stage 1 crap, all these off-the-market tunes have to have a huge amount of wiggle room built into them in the event that you load the tune with your 10% smaller injectors, you have to be able to run as safe as his 10% larger injectors would run right within the same world. So the first step of tuning is always, always, always to get as accurate of information about your specific sensors and engine as possible. And there's a process for doing that, which we're going to go into here in a minute. But that's stage one. Once you have accurate information about all of your engine sensors, then you can go in and specify how much fuel you need, when you want to initiate spark, stuff like that. All right, any questions about tuning the process in general from the online guys? Any in person guys? Nope? Okay. All right, the next thing I want to talk about <coughs> excuse me, is static versus dynamic compression. This is another uh, area that's sometimes misunderstood by the masses. Um, all right, so looking at that, that top thing right there, 9 to 1 compression ratio engine operating at 10 PSI versus a 10 to 1 compression ratio engine operating at 9 PSI, okay? I use this because it's just easy to do the math on it. So if I have, let's just say, 9 liters of air at ambient, and I compress it down to 1 liter of air at ambient, I'm going to have a certain amount of pressure inside of that combustion chamber. If I have a 10 to 1, right, I'm going to have roughly speaking 10% more air right in that in a smaller space. If I take my 9 to 1 compression ratio engine and I pressurize the intake to 10 psi or my 10 to 1 to 9 psi, the total net molecules of oxygen in that combustion chamber is going to be all things being equal exactly the same. Okay? So that's why the guys that talk about how much boost you can run, people lowering the engine compression to handle more boost pressure and all that stuff, it's retarded. There's just no reason to do it. The physics are the physics, okay? So flow is king, right? What we're talking about is how much air, and more importantly, how much O2, you can move into your engine and then move out of your engine per whatever period of time you would like. Flow is what creates power, not the pressure. 
In this specific example, the difference between those two is that when you're not boosting, your 9 to 1 compression ratio engine is less efficient than your 10 to 1 compression ratio engine. So when you're not boosting, your 9 to 1 engine is slower than your 10 to 1 engine. And when you are boosting, at those two different PSIs, they're equally as efficient. So you're making an equal amount of power. Okay, so Ryan has a question. He said, this is why the REW can boost 20 plus PSI compared to the Renesis having issues above 10. Correct. Uh, Ryan, you are mostly correct, okay? The, the, uh, the issue is with low compression engines with high pressure turbochargers, what they're doing is they're figuring out which of these two compressors, because an engine is a compressor, the positive displacement compressor, and your turbo is a centrifugal compressor. But they both do the exact same thing, which is pressurize air. At a certain point, a positive displacement compressor is not as efficient as a centrifugal compressor or a twin screw compressor. If it's not as efficient, what do we create? We talked about when you're below 100% VE, what is the byproduct of that? Heat. Heat, exactly. So... If we put all the work on our positive displacement compressor, at a certain point, it heats things up past the efficiency of what our centrifugal compressor could do. So what you're doing in, in, high, in racing situations or high boost, the FD world, what you're doing is you're just taking the work off of the engine by lowering the compression ratio of the engine and putting it on your com centrifugal compressor. So that's why an FD motor can boost at a higher PSI than RX-8 motor. However, if your tune was right, you had everything dialed in, and you could cool that intake charge via water math or whatever, the RX-8 engine is just as capable of boosting 20 PSI on the right kind of compressor as the FD one is. The problem with it is, and we'll get to that when we talk about our compressor maps, Finding a, a centrifugal compressor that is efficient in the RX-8 range of airflow is all but impossible without a variable vane turbo. And we'll talk a little bit. I think there's a section here about variable vane turbos. But those things are cool. The, the ones that run on the Porsche and stuff like that, they're great. They're expensive as hell. But a, for normal people that don't have $20,000 to spend on a turbo, you're, you're just not going to find one that's efficient based on our airflow and our pressure needs. It's a little easier to find one that can be efficient at a higher pressure for the lower compressor motors in a normal street-driven type of turbo. The answer to your question, Ryan? Okay. Let's move on. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is torque versus horsepower. What we're talking about here, <coughs> this will go. This has to do with increasing the red line on your RX-8 and stuff like that. Um, torque is the instantaneous force that is applied to your eccentric shaft. It is non. It's a static measurement. Right? It, has, it has no measurement of work being performed. It's just the measurement of force being applied. So I go out there, I grab a torque wrench, and I jump on one of the eccentric shaft nuts, and I gorilla grip that thing. I can probably apply 350, 400 pound feet of torque to it. But I can't do that at 1,000 RPMs or 5 RPMs even. Right? So when we talk about horsepower, horsepower is torque measured over a period of time. So as your RPMs increase, provided your torque level stays the same, you create much more power. So this example here is a Honda F1 motor with an 18,000 RPM red line, makes 800 horsepower, but just 281 pound-feet of torque versus a Dodge Ram, which makes 555 pound-feet of torque, but only 35 horsepower. If you look at the, the top is a little dyno here, torque horsepower graph, notice how flat the Honda F1 motor's torque curve is. Okay, so it's creating the same amount of force over a very wide RPM band. 
And if you look at the acceleration measurement down below here, it'll show you that throughout the entire RPM band, the Honda F1 motor would out-accelerate that Dodge Cummins diesel motor, assuming they were geared the same and in the same weighted vehicle and all that crap. It will out-accelerate by exactly the difference in horsepower, not the difference in torque. Okay. So when we talk about messing with torque and all this kind of stuff, people talk about reading dyno grass and all this crap. What you're really talking about is you want a torque curve that is flat and even. We don't want to see the torque curve that's like the uh, a lot of the V8 torque curves where it comes up and spikes real high and then falls off like that. That means you have a narrow band with which to make power. So a nice long flat torque curve means that you have a high rate of acceleration all the way through your RPM band. Okay, so when we start talking about whether we want to go past 9,000 RPMs, the way you determine whether your engine can go past 9,000 RPMs is to look at your torque curve. If the torque starts to fall off about 8,500-ish or whatever, which is typical for RX-8 motors, your horsepower will fall off equally right, based on that, that falling torque curve times your higher level of RPM. Because you're at a very high RPM at that point, you can squeeze a little bit out because even a little bit of a loss of torque multiplied by 9,500 can still keep your horsepower line relatively flat. But at a certain point, you now have just moved beyond reality. So there's no reason to run an engine at 10,000 RPMs that's not making any power at 10,000 RPMs. A lot of wear and tear for no good. That's also why when you're driving your big block V8 and you step on the gas, you feel that like, Whoa! because that narrow torque band is all down low. You know, that 555 or so pound feet of torque in your Cummins diesel. Right, yeah, absolutely. That's why also why they, they're slower, because you have to shift a lot, right? But that initial sensation of speed is the torque multiplied by that RPM. RPM is very low. Torque is very high, so you still get that initial sensation of speed, but as the RPMs climb and the torque falls off, you no longer have any forward movement of that vehicle. All right. We good? Okay, so we talked about most of the stuff already. I'm going to go real quick through this. Uh, we talked about bore and stroke, right? Bore is increasing the size of your sleeve if you're in a piston engine. Stroke is increasing the movement of it, okay? And in the RX state world, um, I've heard of people dishing out rotors to lower the compression, which is sort of the opposite of boring it, because you're making the space bigger, but you're not able to put any more air into it. So it's kind of irrelevant. Um, <coughs> radical cams, or in our case, we're talking about more your bridge port, stuff like that. The more you increase your intake and exhaust overlap with either radical cams or radical porting, means that at higher RPMs, your, while your exhaust is being sucked out of the engine, your intake is already pulling air in. The exhaust actually acts as a method of creating a vacuum, allowing for more air into the engine. Okay? The problem with that is, unless you have a very high volume of flow leaving that exhaust, you don't have enough of a vacuum to get air in. So with radical cams, with, with radical porting, that's why you get that bop, 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 bop sound at idle. It's because the exhaust is actually mixing with the air, diluting the charge, and having a little bit of that reversion, and you have to get it past that certain RPM point before enough flow through is happening to pull the air in and not having the exhaust leak out of the intake track. So everything's a trade-off. You want radical cams, you want radical porting, you want to bridge port it, you're trading low end power for some top end power. With the bridge port, I just had a not really more about the actual impact. The bridge is just so that the seal can pass over. And Correct. It's just so it doesn't want to fall in. Yeah, the, the bridge just holds the corner seal in place. Right, yeah, okay. yep. yeah. Yeah. And generally speaking, it is. Yeah. 
the issue is, you know, we talked about, you know, VE, all the different stuff, right? So the issue is for that in that situation was they were trading VE at the high RPMs for VE at the low RPMs, right? Let it, making it less efficient down low, but that solved the problem of it being inefficient up high. If you don't have enough physical time because of the RPMs to fill the combustion chamber 100% full of air, then you can't make good power or as good a power as you possibly could. If you give it more time to open, then you can get more air in and you make more power. But that creates the net effect on the backside of having that intake reversion at low RPMs. Now, with the RX-8 specifically, our motors, the issue is not the intake flow. The issue is the exhaust flow. We, we, you've got the 90 degree turn issue. You've got just overall size of the ports and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Uh, I got a question from the thing. Can you port the RX-8 exhaust without intake overlap? Yes, <laughs> to a certain degree, but then you have water jacket issues and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, the exhaust ports are definitely the, the choke point. And when we talk about building engine and building power and stuff, especially on a streetcar, what you end up doing is you build the system, and it's going to have some limiting factor. Your turbo is going to be limiting your exhaust port size, your intake port size, whatever, whatever. For the older engines, it was the intake port size was a limiting factor. So they did bridge porting. Now we're in a situation where we have plenty of intake port, but not enough exhaust port. So uh, I think was it the Mazda Trix created that peripheral port, the exhaust manifold and hybrid crazy thing. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it would work all right because you know, our, our rotors are cast with that, the big side exhaust port kind of caster in it, so Mazda Trix just bored it out and then built a header with five flanges on it yeah. to bolt up to those uh, the P-ports there. There you go, that solves your exhaust port space issue. It's a pretty drastic modification to make, but... Peripheral ports? Yeah, it, all that stuff is absolutely possible. You know, the question you got to ask yourself is, how, well, how much money you want to spend? Absolutely. But you also ask yourself, what is that the limiting factor? When we start talking about intake port tuning, because we have all the, <coughs> excuse me, the, you know, the VDI and, uh, SSV and all the different port openings that we have, those all can be tuned with the cob. The question becomes, when do you tune it? Why do you tune it? Right? The only time you would really need to address your exhaust port size issue is if that became the limiting part of your system. If you're all motor, 99% of the time, it's never going to matter. Right? You can go, you can clean them up a little bit and get rid of some of the cast marks and stuff. Maybe smooth out some of the transitions, but that's just changing the flow. It's not really porting it in the true sense of the word. Cool. More power to you. But until the exhaust ports become the limiting factor, there's no reason to go after you get crazy with porting them. Um, you know, I would say, in my opinion, and correct, correct me if you think differently, uh, my opinion is right around the 375 horsepower-ish mark is about the limit of our exhaust ports from what I personally have seen and dealt with. Past that, I would definitely see some legit exhaust port uh, work as being a good idea. I know somebody has broken 400 horsepower with the 8 motor. What's that? With the run assist, yeah. I forget who it was, though. But, yeah, but uh, it would be wheel horsepower, Ryan. About 375 at the wheel would be the limit. And... I mean, it may be worthwhile porting it prior to that, but I do know that 375-ish at the wheels can be run on a daily driven RX-8 without any real negative side effects. So you're not superheating the exhaust, you're still getting air in there, you're not having boost fall off. So all indications are that all your air is moving through that process the way that it should. 
past that, you start running into issues. You'd want to increase the port size. Um, as far as intake ports go, same thing. Smooth it out, you know. saying you know you can lengthen the intake a little bit and lengthen the exhaust a little bit and you end up with a little bit of overlap during idle um, but that's other than that and some small cleanups there's really nothing okay so I would right yeah but again you're trading in your low end power for your top end power Right, and that's a very valid point. Your radical cams are the same way. Radical porting and radical cams are naturally aspirated mods. If you put a turbo on a radically cammed car, it'll run like crap because it's you're just not needed. That amount of duration is not doesn't do anything because you're pressurized your intake. You don't need that much time to keep it open. It just makes the car run like crap when it's not boosting. Yeah. Um, intake and exhaust. Um, obviously, the weak point in the exhaust is the catalytic converter. So if anything past the cat, you can make it as big as you want, and not going to give you any more power. The cat's going to be what limits you. Um, any type of super chip or off-the-shelf type of PCM upgrade is all crap in the sense that it's yeah. Sometimes it's as simple as the resistor on the throttle body that makes it you know open faster or makes the electronic brain think that it's open more than it is. It's all kind of a waste. But the specific thing, issues with it is that it's not specific to your vehicle. So off the shelf, anything you buy, you can just assume it's going to be 10% minimum of a safety factor built in. So what we're trying to do is get that 10% back or get back whatever it is that we can get. Um, racing uh, weight is always a winner. Anytime you lessen weight, especially unsprung weight, it's the equivalent of adding power. Uh, I, I used to, I think it's like a pound per wheel that, that you reduce either through the brake system or the wheel system is the equivalent to like 10 horsepower. Never mind the fact that it stops faster, handles better as well, but it, it's a net effect of drastically increasing the acceleration of your vehicle. Uh, racing gas specifically is designed to allow you to advance timing without detonation, right? It has more of uh, octates in it. However, if you don't advance your timing, it doesn't do you any good. Right? So there's no reason to just put racing gas in it for funzos. You actually have to tune for it. And it's the same thing of water and meth injection and everything else. If you don't tune for it, it's not going to give you any more power. Uh, flywheels and pulleys, uh, again, lightening them, good. However, it also means it will decelerate faster as well. So if you lighten up your flywheel, flywheel and your pulleys, jump on it, it'll rev real quick. But then when you come off it, it's going to fall back down real quick and it makes it some people find it to be difficult to drive a vehicle like that um, say again? right changing gears and stuff like that because you're, the difference between when you come off the gas to shift gears and go back on the gas is so much more drastic with a light lightweight system than with a heavier weighted system because you're not carrying as much momentum uh, as it's spinning Oh, yeah. Shex wanted to know if he removes his exhaust or the catalytic converter, does it automatically mean that if it has more free flow? The answer is yes. Just by virtue of taking the catalytic converter off by itself will increase power. Um, all right, so ignition upgrades, same deal, right? Ignition itself does not make any more power unless you had crappy ignition before. So spark is spark, and if you, as long as it lights off, you're good to go. We increase our ignition power when we have a charge that is so dense that it has a problem lighting off. Air is a horrible conductor of electricity. 
which is good when you're out in a lightning storm especially. But what that means is as the air becomes more and more dense, it becomes more and more difficult for the spark plug gap to have that spark jump across because the air is blocking the electricity. So we create a higher powered uh, ignition system to allow it to jump that gap. But jumping the gap is jumping the gap. If it can jump, whatever you got on there is good to go. You only have to worry about it when you can't jump the gap and you get misfires. But it by itself will not give you any more power. Uh, fuel system upgrades, same deal. If you're not starving your vehicle of fuel, it makes no sense to put in an upgraded fuel system. If your factory fuel pump can keep up with your fuel needs, leave it alone. If you want to get one for reliability, that's a whole different story. I'm talking about just for power. Getting 1,000 cc primary and two injectors on a naturally aspirated motor, just give me your money. And I'll tell you, I'll be like, oh, magically it's in the engine. Um, because you're, it's just not useful. If you don't need it, it's not in and of itself. It's not going to create its own power. And you'd be surprised. I did this class, you know, for obviously more than just RX8 guys. And you would be surprised some of the people that I've seen walk in my class that like have a Honda, you know, VTEC, whatever, and they've dropped like, oh, I got the 750cc upgraded fuel fuel injectors. I'm like, all right, cool. Four. Like, well, I just I bought it as a kit, man. A new fuel rail and stuff, and it's all bigger. <laughs> All right, right on, man. It just means it activates for short time. Right? Yeah, it, exactly. So it, it's just it's a waste. Now, if you need it, obviously, that's the time to upgrade fuel injectors. But if you don't need it, it doesn't do any good. Um, anytime you can increase your suspension or braking performance, <coughs> that's a good one. Um, and then, of course, forced induction is the big one. It's like the granddaddy of all engine mods. And we start pressurizing the intake, and that's where the real power is made. So everything up above that, five horsepower here, five horsepower there, you're never going to notice it. It's not going to have any impact on your – it'll be a panacea, okay? I mean, I've heard people always say, like, oh, you know, I, once they dyno it and they find out they gain five or ten horsepower, they get all excited. I personally will say 15 horsepower can be felt and it feels like you have a snap of your throttle. It's hard to explain, but to me, that's how I describe it. Like, th the pushing the throttle does more. Um, if you ever driven an older car with a cable, bo cable throttle, it feels like you tightened up the, the cable. Um, 50 horsepower? Now we're talking. You know, it, it takes those really, really big changes to have a noticeable impact, unless you're racing. Like, uh, I tuned uh, Mark Monitor Motorsports. He does autocross in the East Coast, and I tuned his car, and he knocked you know, eight-tenths of a second off of his best lap time or whatever after it was tuned. But he's measuring it to that level. He couldn't tell in the car driving. He said it drove nicer. But it was, you know, there was a clock time that changed that had a difference. And obviously it wasn't that much of a difference. If you're less than a second from stoplight to stoplight, unless you're using a measuring device to measure it, you're not going to notice. That's kind of what I'm, what I'm driving at. Um, for tuning an RX-8 naturally aspirated, if you get rid of the cat and you fix the factory tune, Maybe 20 horsepower is about what you can expect to get. 15 to maybe 20 horsepower. Um, my personal record is 208 wheel horsepower on an all-motor RX-8 in Hawaii. That's just with the tuning exhaust. That's not what uh, yeah, it was a tuning. Built engine no, no built engine stuff. It was tuning, uh, exhaust, factory air intake, factory ignition, lightweight flywheel. So, you know, so, less than that just said it <laughs> well, right, but the flywheel's on it before and after. I'm talking about just the, the, the baseline dyno and then the finished dyno. And I'll actually have the dyno here. I'll show you guys when we go to our practical exercises. That's what you're going to expect. And, again, the, the expectation is that it will drive better. It will feel like it's driving better. And in your mind, you can say that it's driving faster. But the reality is that you can't tell. You can tell that it drives better, but you can't tell that it's going to drive faster. And 
to prove that point, you know, if you jump in uh, like Eric's Turbo RX-8 that's out front with 100 more horsepower than what your guys' RX-8s have, and then you can tell, right? Obviously, you'll be able to tell. But it's a, but yeah, think about it. when you when he does it. I wish we could get rise. Maybe we'll take a lunch break and you can give some give some rise. But when he does it and he does the pull, all right, just in your mind, remember that is a hundred more horsepower, one hundred times the difference that you're probably going to have before or after your tune. And just you know, that's the expect. I just want you guys to have that expectation that what we're really trying to do is make the engine as efficient as possible. And it's, it, it translates into being more powerful, but really it's just more efficient. It's more efficient. It's going to drive better. You're going to burn less fuel. You're going to waste less fuel. It's not going to feel as sluggish, but it's not going to be like the old 5.0 Mustangs where you put a thing on it and you get 80 horsepower out of it because they just the factory tune is good enough that you're not going to be able to notice. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so intake and all right, so we talked about our variable valve tuning and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we talked about exhaust shape. Uh, we talked about the scavenging effect, is what I was talking about before about the slug. Okay, if you have a exhaust manifold with three runners on it, which is what we have, and you want to create a, a true header, right? A true equal length header instead of the one we have now, which is not equal length. The reason why people do that is the goal is is that when the where the collector sits, when you have an exhaust pulse hit the collector and actually go into your exhaust, that that it hits a collector while another slug is in one of the other pipes, because it will create that vacuum and pull that other slug out faster. And if you do it right, you get that that harmonic effects where you get the exhaust scavenging. And the intake is the same way. If you have multiple intake runners. If you dial it in just right, you can get it to where the intake pulse from cylinder one or your primary runner will cause a scavenging effect to pull the next slug of air into your uh, second primary intake runner. Okay. Where we get into some variable valve timing stuff is think about a 12 inches of a of a plastic straw, like a McDonald's straw, right? It's about 12 inches long. If you blow through it and you you feel the velocity of the air on your hand, it's pretty high, right? Now picture blowing through a garden hose, 12 inches long. Are you gonna be able to blow as high? No, there's like the, the speed will be down, right? So long, narrow intake runners are very, very good at increasing velocity. But you get to a certain point where that long, narrow runner doesn't have the ability to flow a high enough mass. Your shorter, larger openings, intake runners, <coughs> allow for a very high mass at high uh, velocity levels, but at low velocity, it kind of wanders around and gets lost in the sauce, right? So in theory, if you could design the perfect intake stroke or intake runner, it would start off the size of the McDonald's straw and grow in diameter out to whatever the maximum amount that you needed. That would be an infinitely variable exhaust. It would be perfect. You don't have the technology to do that, right? So what Mazda does do is create the SSV and the VDI, which effectively increases the overall mass of your intake. So you start off with just the primary intake runners on, so it's more long and narrow, right? Then at 4,000-ish RPM, the SSV operates, which then now increases the amount of intake uh, area that you have, right? It's a higher volume. And then at 72 and some change, the VDI opens, which, again, increases the total intake area that you have. So that's their way of handling the best of both worlds. Yeah, the, the, that's, the, that's the APV, actually. That happens at 6,200-ish. The, uh, the VDI is in the center. Have you taken the upper intake manifold all the way off? There's that little barrel in the center that turns like this? That's the VDI. 
So it goes SSV, APV, and then VDI, and they go in stages. But that the goal is, uh, yes, Ryan, you are correct, less harmonic distortion. Um, the goal is is that you are using the smallest intake runner size required without choking the amount of air that goes through, right? So when we talk about tuning the APV and SSV and, and VDI, what you're really trying, or you, what you're saying is, is that my intake is choking out, filling full of air earlier. So if I open it earlier, I'll have less of a dip in power. If you open it too early, you undid, you know, see what I mean? Because you, now you just dropped off the velocity for no reason. Um, so it's a, it's a fine line, and it's something that you really have to play with. <laughs> Without being, without having any kind of forced induction, there's really no reason to to monkey with it at all. With some forced induction going on, and you look at your dyno curve, you might actually see benefits to it. Because if you say you look at your dyno curve and it kind of comes up and then flattens out right before 4,000 RPMs, and then all those things you go boop. Well, now you know there's probably a choke point there. You might open the SSV a little earlier. You might see some benefits from that. Uh, Ryan wants to know, FI applications benefit more from the VDI delete because of the same principle? Uh, yes, in some ways. Uh, a lot of the <coughs> the whole APV blocking or VDI blocking for, uh, plates that they put on for the forced induction stuff is really to make tuning easier. That's really the benefit of it. Um, you still are reducing the total mass of air or let me phrase that, you're reducing the total volume of air that can travel, right? Your mass is increased because you pressurize the air intake. However, what you do avoid by doing that is having that thing open all of a sudden, having this big, huge rush of air into your system when you haven't properly tuned for it, and creating this massive lean spot in your tune under load, right, which is where we talked about it increases the fuel flame speed and can cause engine damage. So it's it's less of a principle of intake tuning and more of a principle of making tuning easier, less variables to tune. All right. What's that going to help you out? On the exhaust side of things, the, the concept of a long tube header or any kind of header is the exhaust scavenging effect. If you can keep all of the exhaust uh, pipes equal length going to the collector, that's when you get that where one pulse width will pass through and actually help pull out the other pulse width and so on. It makes your exhaust more efficient. The problem with it is just very difficult to create a truly equal length mandrel bent header because your exhaust ports are physically in different locations. So if you've ever seen like a V8 header, you know, these just get all crazy shapes and stuff, and what they're trying to do is just keep it all the same up to the collector and then bring it out of one collector. Right, and because the middle port is Siamese port, right, that mm -hmm. creates some trouble because you're getting yep. pulse from the middle at the same time as pulse from either. One of the other ends, correct. So, and then Ryan wants to know, what is the adverse effects of leaving the SSV open is, yes, if you leave the SSV open all the time, you have low-end power loss. Anytime you leave the intake larger than it has to be, it will result in power loss. Anytime you leave the intake smaller than it has to be, also creates power loss. So, if you open everything up, down low, you will lose power. If you leave everything closed, you're going to lose power up top. You are correct. Yep. Velocity down low and volume up high. All right. We talked a little bit about porting and polishing. Basically, what you're doing in the RX-8 world is polishing off the cast marks and some of the transitions and getting rid of, of anything that will impede flow. 
Uh, the only real con to it is that it's expensive and labor intensive and doesn't have a huge benefit to it. Really the biggest con to that one. Um, we, t we did the flow, velocity, and power conversation to death, so I'm not going to beat that dead horse. We just know that we lose velocity down low, we lose flow up top. That's kind of where your trade-off is always going to be. And anytime you can smooth the transition, it's always a good one. All right, so here's uh, the, some cam stuff, which we're not going to spend too much time on. But if you notice, and this the principle is the same for a rotary, on your radical cam, which is up top, versus your standard cam down low in these pictures here, it's the overlap that causes that reversion. So if you see down below on the cam profile, it has a very small overlap up top where both the intake and exhaust port are open, right? Whereas the top one, you see that the, the intake and the exhaust port are open for a much longer at the same time. That's your reversion issue. And when you do a porting job, it's the same issue. As you lengthen the two teardrops and get them closer together, then there's a point where the, when the rotor passes over, they're both open. And of course, forced induction, a whole different ball of wax. A performance cam or a porting job for forced induction is different than for naturally aspirated. You do not want a radical cam on a forced induction engine. You do not want radical porting on a forced induction engine because it's just a waste of time. It doesn't do you any good. Okay, so we, everybody kind of knows what a turbocharger is. Um, Biggest advantage to it is that it can be put in anywhere in your exhaust stream. It's very portable, right? The mechanism of compression comes from your exhaust flow. So as long as there's exhaust flowing over it, it will do its job. Um, build your own kit. You can put it anywhere you want. You can buy a kit. Typically, the kits are easier to manufacture than a supercharger kit by virtue of the fact that you just create your own manifold and find a spot where the turbo is going to fit and be happy. Uh, your disadvantages of it, um, really the two biggest ones that you guys have to be concerned about is the right size turbo for the application. If you if you get a big turbo, you have boost lag, and you get too small of a turbo, you have a very high exhaust temperatures at the higher end of the spectrum because your AR trim, which is the trim that that impeller is for the exhaust, actually blocks the exhaust at a certain point when you have enough exhaust flowing through it, right? Um, that's where the variable vane turbo comes into play where the Porsches and all those, they have the actual vanes rotate so that as it spins faster and faster, the vanes go from being more like a fan blade to being much closer to like a jet impeller and get out of the way. That's really what it boils down to. So they're fantastic for doing that. They are expensive the biggest downside of those guys. Um, and then the other big advantage, in my opinion, to a turbocharger is you have a boost controller. Everything is pressure actuated, so because of that, you have very, you can do some real fine tuning on the turbo system to create a nice smooth boost curve if you want. You can create a boost spike down low if you want. You can create an ever-increasing boost pressure to redline if you want. However, it suits your driving style, you can do. Um, mine was much closer to that muscle car kind of a vibe where I had it dialed in so I got a, the maximum amount of boost as early as possible and then maintained that 10 or 12 PSI all the way to red line. But it had the net effect of making my car drive like a V8 RX-8, very similar. Superchargers um, that don't have... Too many advantages, honestly, um, with the exception of it doesn't create any additional heat in your exhaust. It's really the biggest advantage to a supercharger. It has to be physically mounted somewhere to the engine that is part of the pulley system. It has to run on the pulley. It runs all the time. It's a parasitic loss on your engine because it takes power to turn the pulley, which is a greater parasitic loss than a turbo. Okay. Um, now that we've kind of come into more of the clutched superchargers, if you guys are familiar with those at all, you know how your AC compressor 
on your has a pulley on it, but it's got a clutch built into it. So you turn it on and it uses it. You turn it off and it just spins freely. They're starting to develop different types of clutched superchargers, whereby at low RPMs and low throttle, the clutch is disengaged and the supercharger just is just spinning freely. Like the charger is not doing anything. Yeah, just the uh, the the pulley is just spinning freely. So there's no drag on your engine. And then either a certain RPM or a certain throttle position or a combination thereof, um, the, there's a, different way, a couple different ways to do it. The one I've seen, what was it? I think it was like the GTR. Some guy built a twin turbo, twin supercharged uh, GTR. It was either there or somewhere. But anyway, it, the, the weights from the, there was weight built into the clutch assembly, and as it rotated past a certain speed, the centrifugal force would bring that weight out, engage the supercharger, and then allow the supercharger to turn. So then when you're just puff button around and you don't need the supercharger, it's not doing any, it's not doing you any harm. Yeah. And then when you do need it, it's helping you. Um, but that's a, obviously much like the variable vane turbo, that creates an expense that you're going to have to deal with, and not too many people are willing to spend that money on that expense. Um, and then there's no boost controller with a supercharger, so you just need simply changing the size of your pulley if you want to increase the amount of pressure that it's generating. Which, by changing the pulley size to a smaller pulley, spin faster, pressurizes more air. Uh, nitrous oxide we beat to death. Um, as far as the PPO2 thing, it's just it's liquid nitrogen and oxygen. As it expands, goes past the first stage regulator, it causes it to turn into vapor, gets pushed into the engine. Right, you got a wet system and a dry system. Wet system is the same nozzle that injects the nitrous, injects the fuel. That way you don't run lean and off to the races. The problem with that is is that a wet system is generally installed in your intake track. So if it's on, but there's no engine sucking it out of your intake track, you now have a highly flammable cocktail in your upper intake. And when it goes off, not so much if, when, when it goes off, it's going to break stuff. It's going to break your intake. It's going to, you know, in the cases of some of the V8 guys that do nitrous, it'll actually just light the whole <laughs> engine bay on fire. You know, it just depends on what the situation is. A dry system, um, a dry system has the advantage of it being not mixed with fuel until it's inside the engine where it belongs. However, you have to have the factory fuel system accommodate the nitrous. So you have to have, usually it's with a standalone fuel system, whereby when the nitrous activates, the nitrous solenoid activates, it also tells the engine PCM to add 20 or 30 or 40 percent more fuel. Otherwise, you will run very, very lean and you go grenade your engine. So a dry system is better, just more expensive. What system is good for like lower horsepower applications? That's a wet system. Um, all right, Ryan wants to know that SC generates less heat and less side seal wear. It generates less heat, Ryan, in the exhaust. It generates more heat in the intake. So you have less latent heating of the exhaust, which many have postulated increases the wear of the side seals because of the, where the exhaust physically is located that rear exhaust uh, port and how close it is to that rear rotor and engine. So if you superheat the exhaust, the, th the theory is that it creates a lot of wear and tear on the engine because you're not getting the hot exhaust away from it enough. Um, however, I personally believe that the side seal tolerances are what's really causing the side seal wear. The factory engine tolerances are very, very high, which allows for a lot of blow by. You know, just like bad rings on a piston engine, same concept. You get a lot of blow-by going on, and you have a lot of that hot exhaust being blowing into your intake and compression stroke, which creates a much hotter running engine, increases seal wear. Did that answer your question, Ryan?
Bueller. You. <laughs> For the most part, um, well, which heat were you specifically thinking about? I'm going to answer this question before we take another break. Yes, that is correct. The, his question was the talk about the specific to the turbo placement, uh, the low mount turbos, your ready kits, heighten the problem of high exhaust gas temperatures because it's physically sitting with the exhaust. So really, you're now you're compounding the problem with the side seal wear um, because it's it's there. That's a b turbos that are undersized, meaning that the AR trim becomes an impediment. If you're blocking the flow of exhaust, where is that exhaust going to go? It's going to sit in the manifold and be hot. So the next time that the apex seal passes over, you now have a bunch of hot exhaust mixing with a bunch of hot exhaust. And it, you're getting exposure to all of the intake or the engine parts of that hot exhaust. And the goal is you want to get the hot exhaust away as fast as possible. And if you're choking it out and leaving it in that exhaust manifold, it creates some issues. And yes, it also causes OMP issues because of heat saturation. Um, just in general, heat saturation is always an issue with a, with any kind of with anything really. That long tube type header, when that when it starts moving around and touching, getting close to other things in the engine bay, you're going to start seeing heat saturation issues with that thing too. You've got to put some sort of insulation on a turbo to insulate the rest of the engine from the hot exhaust. So, right, you want to keep the hot side hot and the cold side cold. So you want to insulate it, turbo blankets, all those kind of things will help insulate that turbo from the rest of the engine. And then really the only issue at that point that you're going to have, if you blanket it all really, really well and made it 100% uh, heat proof, you still have a problem if you're blocking up your exhaust because your AR trim is too high, or I'm sorry, too low. If there's too much, you know, of a propeller blade on that thing, every time that engine cycles, if there's still hot exhaust in that header, right, or in that manifold, it has is being exposed, re-exposed to the engine. So the engine is sitting in hotter exhaust for longer. It's really the biggest issue with that. A properly sized turbo, you don't have that problem. Okay, but like the factory ready type of turbo, you can run into those problems because the AR trim is very low. All right, any other questions before we take another break? <coughs> yeah, Kane, um, is there an issue with um, longevity of the um, life of the turbo if you have it overheated by having like a beanie on it uh, rather than having the slightly remotely located you heat shielding you, you you said you overheated the what i'm sorry uh, i've just been talking with a turbo guy and um he was saying he doesn't like to use the turbo beanies you know the wraps that go straight on the uh, hot side uh snail um because it does cause overheating in the turbos a lot of the time and he prefers to use uh heat shielding you know that sits sort of a half inch or so out from uh, the turbine housing? Yes, that is correct. Air is the number one best insulator from heat. His question was the turbo wraps, you know, like the turbo beanies, the blankets, um, are not as good as heat shielding that's like half an inch away from your hot exhaust. And he's absolutely correct. Air in and of itself is the best insulator to heat. If you can create a little bit of an air standoff and then some sort of blocking heat wrap, Great. If you cannot, your turbo beanies and your exhaust wrap will usually do a good job. Um, the biggest downside to them is that they also will trap moisture up against your exhaust manifold or your turbo or whatever. So that's generally the, the biggest negative to anything that's going to touch your 
cast iron parts is that if it rains or they get wet, they're going to hold on to the moisture more than a cast iron part would. So by, therefore, it is going to cause additional wear and tear and corrosion issues. Well, Brian, Brian asked the question, does it contradict everything supporting the benefits of exhaust traps? Again, Ryan, it's all a trade-off, man. If the if you could wrap your exhaust with a heat shield all the way 100% of the way around it that sat exactly half inch off all of your exhaust, that would be the ideal situation. You're going to be paying a bunch of money for it, right? So exhaust wrap is better than nothing. Heat uh, turtle blanket is better than nothing. However, it does have the net effect of increasing your corrosion. And there is certain instances where it could theoretically overheat the bearings and coke the oil if you trapping all of that heat very, very close to the center housing of the turbo. Um, okay, so the variable vane turbos, there's another question about the variable vane turbos. If cost is not an option, the variable vane turbo would be the best option for our type of engine because our engine operates in such a wide power band. But because it's high compression, we need we want a turbo that generates 12 to 14 psi efficiently from 1,000 rpm to 9,000 rpm. That's ideally what we want. There is no such thing on the market that is efficient at that range. If it's efficient down low, it's inefficient at that PSI at higher RPMs and vice versa. So a variable vane turbo would allow you to be efficient across the entire operating range. Um, they are, however, expensive. And the tuning would actually be easier on a variable vane turbo. It's the cost. They're cost prohibitive because I think the cheapest one you can find is five grand just for the turbo. Doesn't include anything else. Just for the snail, you're out five grand, and then you got to build the rest of your kit, and it would be very expensive. Okay, guys. Um, before we get into this really fun stuff, yay, math. We're gonna go ahead and take a break. Um, take about a five minute break, and I'm gonna grab something else to drink. And then we'll get started to on all the specific math and then move to actually tuning the uh, cob. <laughs> 